Congress did not obviate, but instead exacerbated these problems by enacting Joint Resolution No. 114, which licensed the president to, quote, use the armed forces of the United States as he determines to be necessary and appropriate in order to defend the national security of the United States against the continuing threat posed by Iraq, which was constitutionally invalid because it was not even formally a proper delegation of authority, insofar as it lacked any definition of what constituted the, quote, continuing threat posed by Iraq. This mandated no intelligible standards of what was, quote, necessary and appropriate to which the president had to conform, and required no findings of specified facts prerequisite to and in justification of military action which Congress or the judiciary could review, instead leaving everything of consequence to the president's unilateral, quote, determination. Also, it rested upon rank speculation concerning future malevolent actions by Iraq's leaders. Which procedure could rationalize preemptive strikes in the manner of the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor against any well-armed foreign nation that refused to kowtow to the president's international pretensions? No exoneration for Congress can be found either in the portion of the joint resolution that licenses the president to, quote, use the armed forces to enforce all relevant United Nations Security Council resolutions regarding Iraq. For even if the latter resolutions are valid, and the United States are required by dint of treaties to support them, they cannot absolve Congress of its duty to, quote, declare war as the necessary prerequisite to that state of international affairs. All treaties must yield to the paramount and supreme law of the Constitution. Against this background, whatever has been done in furtherance of military adventurism in Iraq is arguably a war crime, because the original mandate purportedly authorizing it was unlawful. Presumably, this occurred not because congressmen were criminally minded, but rather because they were morally lax. They wanted to prevent personal and political responsibility by passing the buck to the president. That does not exculpate them, however. To the contrary, failing to declare war under proper constitutional standards or otherwise to stop or even to protest the president's initiation of hostilities, let alone to approve and facilitate it, amounts in and of itself to a war crime under the maxim cui potest et debit vitare tassens iubet. Meaning, by remaining silent, he who can and ought to forbid something commands it. So at least probable cause exists to conclude that every member of Congress who voted for warfare against Iraq in the operational sense, without voting to, quote, declare war in the constitutional sense, is arguably complicit in all the, quote, war crimes that may have arisen out of the invasion, occupation, and attempted pacification of Iraq. Inasmuch as no immunities from or statutes of limitations of war crimes that result in mass human deaths ought ever to be recognized, and inasmuch as we the people would be required in justice to hand over the responsible miscreants for trial and punishment in the countries that suffered from their misdeeds, the maxim cui potest et debit vitare tassens iubet could bear heavily on the present could bear heavily on the pres could bear heavily on the present generation of public officials in the general government this is not to condemn these people out of hand and without a trial but to emphasize that if they could play so fast and loose with such a weighty issue of homeland security as an actual military invasion of a foreign country dismissing the key provision of the Constitution as anachronistic and its invocation as a frivolous proposal, 
infusing into the presidency dangerous powers that we the people specifically withheld from it, and setting an American precedent for wars and aggression, the foundational war crime charged and proven against the Nazis at Nuremberg then they can be expected to fall down on the job of providing constitutional and effective homeland security everywhere else. And, in particular, with respect to the militia of the several states. An effective response to these dangers requires that we the people reassert control over all our governmental institutions, and in particular, over the power of the sword and the power of the purse, or most directly over the power of the sword first, foremost, and forever, because with that power securely in our hands, the power of the purse and all other governmental power will be safely ours as well. The forces behind the ever-deepening political corruption in this country believe that money talks, that control over the power of the purse exercised through the alliance of politicians, bankers, and their clients, focused in the Federal Reserve System, enables them to dominate every aspect of American life. This short-sightedness promises to be their undoing. Machiavelli proved that the sinews of war are not gold, with his commonsensical observation that gold alone will not procure good soldiers, but good soldiers will always procure gold. This insight Mao Zedong confirmed in the dictum he drew from revolutionary struggle that, quote, political power grows out of the barrel of a gun. For the power of the purse is a political power, and if, as with all other political power, in the final analysis of interpersonal conflict, its actual physical efficacy grows out of the barrel of a gun, then the power of the sword must be its antecedent and superior. Moreover, on the higher plane of political morality, where right must always proceed and justify might, the Second Amendment codifies this relationship as a principle of American constitutional law, because as the amendment asserts, a well-regulated militia is necessary to the security of a free state. And because the power of the purse is one of the most important powers of any state, therefore, a well-regulated militia is necessary for the security and ultimately the exercise of the power of the purse in a free state, making the power of the purse dependent upon the power of the sword. So armed with the power of the sword, we the people will be able to secure execution of all laws, especially the supreme law of the land, to suppress insurrections and domestic violence, to repel invasions, and to deal decisively with every other danger that threatens any aspect of homeland security. The question is, how can we the people reassert our control over the power of the sword. The present nationwide concern with homeland security provides patriots with a unique opportunity. To take advantage of it requires recognition that homeland security exhibits two inseparable aspects, security and especially homeland and that the importance of the two terms is in direct proportion to their positions in that phrase. The powers that be in the District of Columbia today focus almost exclusively on technical issues of security, as if security in some abstract and absolute sense were the ultimate, uniquely worthwhile, or the only achievable goal. Rather, the true and indispensable goal is to preserve all the social, economic, political, and especially legal traditions of the homeland, not only against foreign terrorists and other enemies, but also against any foreign or domestic subversives, 
usurpers or tyrants intent upon misusing homeland security as an occasion, excuse, or means to set up a thoroughgoing international security apparatus. A centralized national police cum intelligence cum surveillance bureaucracy composed of careerists who consider themselves outside of and legally superior to we the people who are suspicious of and unsympathetic to we the people and who conceive it their mission to impose ever more intensive ever more invasive and ever more abusive controls on we the people in service of purposes alien to we the people's interests. Americans widely divergent in political persuasions are rightly concerned that the Department of Homeland Security, or DHS, exhibits the potential and has already been launched on the necessary trajectory to degenerate into an archetypal ministry of the interior of some East European Stalinist satellite of the 1950s. In the DHS, they foresee the foundation for a national police state, the cornerstone of a garrison state steeled for interminable global warfare, and even more ominously, the capstone of an internal security state arrayed for operations against dissenters among America's own domestic population. And these suspicions are not devoid of evidentiary support. Among the, among the imagined dangers against which the DHS is supposed to protect her, America is not confronted with imminent attack from some military superpower, or even from a power, let alone alliance of powers, with the capabilities of any major combatant in World War II. Rather, rather, the announced threat of terrorism stems merely from small, loosely connected international criminal gangs. Yet, in supposed response to this diffuse danger, Americans' constitutional and other civil liberties are being seriously curtailed and compromised in wholesale fashion. Although only in its formative stage, the DHS has already assumed an aggressively antagonistic posture as against potentially every individual in the entire country outside of the political and economic elite. Even more disturbing are foreboding by are forebodings by such prominent members of the armed forces as retired General Tommy Franks, who, who warned that a future terrorist attack of large proportions could stampede Americans into accepting militarization of their country, and with the possible dismantling of constitutional protections. Exactly how such militarization would occur, and under, which, and under whose auspices, pursuant to what authority, and why patriotic Americans not paralyzed by irrational fear should acquiesce in it, are left to conjecture. Forecasts of this kind are particularly ominous because the Constitution nowhere provides in, nowhere provides in so many words for martial law. This doubtlessly reflects Blackstone's warning that martial law, which is built upon no settled principles, but is entirely arbitrary in its decisions, is in truth and reality no law, but something indulged, rather than allowed as a law. The necessity of order and discipline in an army is the only thing which can give it countenance, and therefore it ought not be permitted in time of peace when the courts are open for all persons to receive justice according to the laws of the land. The Constitution provides that the writ of habeas corpus shall not be suspended, unless when in cases of rebellion or invasion the public safety may require it. But such suspension, by itself, would not amount to full-blown martial law, because prisoners denied the writ could still be held in civil rather than military custody. Also true, 
the Fifth Amendment mandates that no person shall be held that no person shall be held to answer for a capital or otherwise infamous crime unless on a presentment or indictment of a grand jury, except in cases arising in the land or naval forces or in the militia when in actual service in time of war or public danger. But this applies only to individuals actually in the land or naval forces or in the militia, and only under certain specified conditions, not to all Americans, either at all times or even under those conditions. Moreover, these are narrowly drawn exceptions from age-old protections for fundamental civil liberties, and as such must be strictly construed. In addition, the facts that must be proven to allow these exceptions to apply, namely that a rebellion, invasion, war, or other public danger has actually arisen, and that the public safety actually requires such action, are what lawyers call constitutional facts. That is, the facts that must be found as a prerequisite to the application of relevant constitutional principles. Constitutional facts must be adjudicated by the judiciary according to the rules of evidence. Not simply assumed to exist by legislators, executive officials, administrative agencies, or least of all, military tribunals. So, were martial law even arguably to be applicable nationwide and promiscuously to common Americans, either all of the constitutional courts, both national and state, would have to permanently would have to be permanently closed by force, or military forces would have to be engaged in invading and pacifying the entire country. An eventuality that would that could only occur if those forces' commanders were intent on suppressing we the people as a whole, and thereby overthrowing the Constitution. Thus, because no imaginable terrorist strikes could create the conditions that could rationalize the imposition of martial law throughout America, references to such strikes as sufficient reasons for that result expose themselves as black propaganda designed psychologically to condition people in a future period of panic to accept what everyone in calm reflection would reject out of hand. A national police state apparatus invoking the powers of martial law in the name of homeland security, or for any other purpose for that matter, is unprecedented unconstitutional, and unacceptable to every thinking American. For military leaders to predict it without emphasizing their unalterable opposition is unworthy of their uniforms. For politicians to propose it, let alone attempt to put it into practice, is unconscionable. That any free people would acquiesce in, let alone, let alone accede to, such a scheme is unbelievable. Nonetheless, the necessary and sufficient framework is being erected, by default if not actual intention, with everyone aware of, many vocalizing their anxiety over, and even some unabashedly approving what is happening, but with vanishingly few dissenters apparently willing or able to do much of anything to thwart or even slow down these developments, or to eliminate or even mitigate the dangers they pose. Why is this so? And even more importantly, why are patriots not turning the situation to their own account by proposing alternatives for homeland security that would appeal to the vast majority of Americans by protecting everyone's security and constitutional liberty at the same time? Why are patriots not demonstrating how to win the war on terrorism, and more importantly, to suppose and suppress the sinister forces actually behind it, according to strict constitutional standards? This is mainly for two reasons. 
One, all too many Americans have allowed themselves to be deluded by politicians' facile but fallacious argument that we the people must sacrifice actual liberty in the airy hope of an exchange for apparent security. This begs the practical questions of whether Americans will obtain, will obtain sufficient security at all, bureaucratic incompetence being the order of the present day and whether, precisely by surrendering any liberties for security, they will end up losing all of their liberties. More fundamentally, it begs the question of whether true security can even exist without the fullness of constitutional liberty, because liberty is not a consequence of, but instead a precondition for, security. That is, liberty is necessary to achieve security, and indeed is the most important part of defining characteristics of security. Security cannot always preserve liberty, but security can never be achieved in the absence of or with antagonism towards liberty. So the real task of challenging this country is to define and organize homeland security for the purpose of preserving while always maintaining and through we the people's own use of liberty. More tellingly, almost all of we the people have failed to read and heed our own constitution, and to understand and consequently demand the solution to the problem of homeland security that the constitution contains. And more to the point, commands. Had we done so, we would have discovered that the solution is the militia of the several states. As Justice Joseph Story pointed out long ago, the militia is the natural defense of a free country against all sudden foreign invasions, domestic insurrections, and domestic usurpation of power by rulers. It is against sound policy for a free people to keep up large military establishments and standing armies in time of peace, both from the enormous expenses with which they are attended and the facile means which they afford to ambitious and unprincipled rulers to subvert the government or trample upon the rights of the people. The right of the citizens to keep and bear arms, has justly been considered as the palladium of the liberties of the Republic, since it offers a strong moral check against any usurpation and arbitrary power of rulers, and will, generally, even if these are successful in the first instance, enable the people to resist and triumph over them. Large, centralized, bureaucratic, and professional police domestic security and intelligence establishments, especially those that can exert their authority by force of arms in one state or locality, with personnel drawn from other states and localities, should not be kept up either, because they too, perhaps to a degree even greater than large military establishments and standing armies, provide a facile means to ambitious and unprincipled rulers to subvert the government or trample upon the rights of the people. The history of the 20th century emphatically teaches that such police, domestic security, and intelligence establishments inevitably tend, if they are not always intended from their inceptions, to serve the special interests of self-perpetuating political cum economic elitists at common people's expense. Thus, they are always at least potential instruments of tyranny. Militia, conversely, provide a people with forces for deterrence, and where that fails, defense, and where that fails, resistance. Justice's story's observation that the militia is the natural defense of a free country should encourage patriots to assert the controlling applicability of the Constitution to the present crisis of homeland security, and to rivet the public's attention on a critically important part of the Constitution, which is the militia of the several states. 
to educate all Americans about their part in the militia of the several states and their right, or ultimately their duty as citizens, to possess and be trained in arms and the related skills necessary to provide their country with homeland security. And to revitalize the militia of the several states across the country by state statutes and, through the militia, to acquire for patriots an indispensable and vital institutional presence in the general government, the governments of the general states, and the political process at every level. This to strengthen the positions of the states against the general government from being bullied by it, and of we the people against both the general government and the state, and the states, thereby securing constitutional federalism, and overall, to organize homeland security through the use of, for the purpose of preserving, and while always maintaining liberty. Because inasmuch as, in Justice Story's estimation, the militia is the natural defense of a free country, and the right of the citizens to keep and bear arms is the palladium of the liberties of a republic, the militia of the several states are not only the primary instruments for securing Americans' liberty, but also the most convincing signs of its present existence and of Americans' determination to preserve and protect it. Chapter 1, End Thank you for joining us for the School of the U.S. Constitution's presentation of Dr. Edwin Vieira's book, Constitutional Homeland Security. Hope you'll join us for the next part.